This is the video for A3.2 on classification and cladistics, which is a higher level topic. When we say classification, we mean putting something into a group. And that group can be based on common ancestry or shared traits or both. So for example, I might say something is a mammal or something is a fish. Now, one of the advantages of classification is once we do that, we know a lot about that organism. So for example, if I know that something is a mammal, I automatically know that it has things like fur, it produces milk, it's warm blooded, amongst other things. And the same with fish. I know if something is classified as a fish, that it's got fins, that it's got gills. There are lots of things that I can tell about an organism once I know how it's classified. For ages, biology students would have been required to memorize the different taxonomic levels. So these are different levels of classification, and they go in order from largest to smallest or most specific, okay? And so I would always have my students say things like domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And then once we knew where an organism was classified, we could then know a lot about it. But as we're getting better at understanding evolutionary relationships, deciding on which exact taxonomic level or which exact group something belongs to is very difficult. So in this uh, curriculum, we don't necessarily need to know all of these different levels. What we need to have a better understanding of is how the science of classification is changing and what the difficulties are of placing things into these specific groups. So let's take a look at the two most specific taxonomic levels, genus and species. So for humans, that's like Homo sapiens. Within a genus, you would have several different species. But how do we know, okay, if these species really belong in the same genus? How do we even know if two things are a separate species? So that's discussed in a previous topic as to whether or not we should even be using the word species. So there's no common agreement really as to which traits um, things must have to belong into certain groups. So how do I know that species B and C shouldn't be their own genus and species A shouldn't be its own genus? How do I know that they all belong together? So at one time, that was fairly clear. We were basing things off of characteristics that we could see. Now that we're able to sequence genomes, that's becoming less clear um, in terms of how separate things actually are. The other difficult is that, or the other difficult piece is that divergence is very gradual. So it's hard to tell exactly when two things should be put into separate groups. So whether that's separate species or a separate genus or a separate phylum, okay? And this is something called the boundary paradox. So it's just very hard to tell where that boundary is. Um, how do we know when things are actually separate species or a separate genus or a separate order? Are we artificially creating boundaries um, or should we be leaving things more open. Again, no one's expecting you to have these answers, but you are expected to understand why we're questioning this method of classification. And really the way things are moving is to a classification system, not based on like artificial boundaries, but on evolutionary relationships. And so this is really kind of the focus of how we're going to classify organisms um, from now on. So no more of those taxonomic levels to be memorized so much. This is where we really wanna put our thinking effort. When we're classifying things based on evolutionary origin, we have to keep two things in mind. One of which is that if I'm saying that two organisms share a common ancestor, like let's take the chimpanzee and the bonobo, they, if they share a common ancestor, they must be in the same taxonomic group. So for example, if I'm saying that these are both sharing a common ancestor, they both need to be in the group of mammals and they both need to be in the group of primates. So that's one thing. The other thing I need to consider is that uh, within a group, all of the species involved in that group have to come from the same common ancestor. So if I'm saying that these two are in a group, then they must have come from a common ancestor. So that's how we're really putting together these types of diagrams. This is called a cladogram. It's all based on common ancestry.
One of the big advantages to classifying organisms this way is that if you know something belongs to a group from a common ancestor, then you already know a lot about that. So for example, if I find a new species of bat, I may not know much about that new species, but I know that it is classified in this group of mammals or this group that descended from a common ancestor, and so I already know a lot about it. I already know it's going to be warm-blooded. I already know that it's going to produce milk and all of those other mammalian characteristics. So there's a lot of great advantages there of classifying organisms in this way. This is a uh, diagram called a cladogram, and when we're looking at these, we can find groups called clades. So clades are groups of organisms that descended from a common ancestor. It includes that common ancestor and all of the species that descended from that common ancestor, whether they are living or not. Clades can be big and general, or they can be small and specific. So for example, I can make a clade out of just these two species, it includes both those species and the common ancestor from which they descended. Or I could make a more general clade. I could say, oh, this is a clade that I want to discuss more about. It would include all of those species and the common ancestor that they descended from. So just clades aren't necessarily a certain size, but it does always include the common ancestor and the descendant species. So how are we getting these diagrams? Well, we're going to take pieces of molecular evidence, so either genes or amino acid sequences. Remember, they're related. Amino acids are coded for by genes. And we're going to find a gene that organisms have in common, and we're going to see how closely those sequences or amino acids align. So for example, if I look at the organisms um, on this cladogram, I would expect, if I'm comparing the same gene, that these two would have more sequences in common than, let's say, the chimpanzee and the baboon. So why is that? Well, you have to go further back in time to find a common ancestor between the chimpanzee and the baboon. That's all the way down here. This is their last common ancestor right here. I have to go much further back in time to find that. When you go further back in time, what we have to envision is that common ancestor diverging into species, uh, separate species, and then mutations are adding up. They're accumulating throughout that time as those organisms evolve differently. And so those mutations, again, are going to give us different genomic sequences. So classifying organisms like this and using this kind of like what we call molecular clock represents a huge paradigm shift in our way of how we're thinking about classifying organisms. So again, no longer those taxonomic levels so much, but really thinking about evolutionary origin, how far back in time you have to go to find their common ancestor, and how many mutations or genomic differences have accumulated since that common ancestor diverged. So we really wanna have a good understanding of what this term molecular clock means and how we're using it. It's important to note that mutations don't always happen at the same rate. We have a pretty good idea of a range of rates, right? So depending on conditions, um, we think a mutation will occur every so often. So we can make some guesses as to how far back in time you have to go if you uh, have a certain number of mutations that or differences that you're looking at. But of course, it's not perfect. So these are going to be estimates, okay, based on the number of genomic differences that we're seeing. And this is a skill that you should actually be able to demonstrate. So we'll be looking at sequence alignments using something called BLAST. So that's a program that you should definitely be using where you can go in and put in these different organisms and take a look at a gene that they might all have in common. There's gonna be a lot to choose from. What we wanna look for is areas of similarity and then also areas of differences, okay? And again, the more differences two organisms have, the further back in time I have to go to find their common ancestor, okay? So definitely something to look into. It's important to note that when these cladograms are being put together, 
We're not just comparing one gene. You would want to compare lots of genes that organisms have in common. The problem is when you do that, you're gonna get one answer about the likely relationship if you're looking at one gene and a different answer if you're looking at the likely relationship comparing another gene. There's just a lot of variety there. So computers are a great tool to kind of like analyze patterns there, and they're going to come up with the likelihood or the likely nature of these relationships based on what we call the principle of parsimony. So the principle of parsimony basically says the simplest answer is usually correct. Now let's take a look at that in action. If I'm taking a look at this cladogram here, and I wanna look at the evolution um, of this blue color, okay? In order for this to be true, this blue color would have had to evolve twice here and give it uh, that blue color to this organism and here. So I would have to assume that that blue color evolves twice. If I look at this version of the same organisms just put together in a different evolutionary relationship, that blue color only has to evolve once. Okay, so that would give rise then to both of these organisms having that blue color. So in that case, the principle of parsimony would favor this kind of relationship. The simplest answer is usually correct, okay? Now, it's important to note that these change all the time because cladograms are just likely evolutionary relationships developed based on the fewest number of changes possible to explain those differences. And of course, as we get more information, sometimes we have to change our mind. So we've talked about cladograms quite a bit, but let's put some official terminology on that, right? Let's talk about some parts of this cladogram. And I'm actually going to start with what we consider to be a clade. Again, you can make a clade that's big or you can make a clade that's small. That's totally up to you how specific you want to be. So a clade just simply has to be a group of organisms and their common ancestor, okay? Now, what I'm gonna find is within a clade that I have several terminal branches. So those terminal branches are going to represent individual species within a clade. I'm also going to need to find the node, and the node would rep represent the common ancestor from all of the species within that clade. So whatever this ancestral species is, this doesn't exist anymore because this species diverged into what became the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the bonobo, right? So this would be that ancestral species that is part of this clade. And the last bit here that we'll take a look at is the root. The root is going to be this part here that represents the root or the origin of all of the clades in your diagram. Traditional taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, that bit, is based on characteristics. And for ages, scientists and biologists were putting things into categories with the best information that they had based on what they could see. Cladistics is quite a bit different. So this we're basing things off of evolutionary origin and gene sequences. And with that new information, we have had to reclassify a lot of organisms that we thought belonged together. So one example that we should probably know is the figwort family. Figworts are a type of plant and the figwort family at one time was huge. There were over 5,000 species in that family and they all shared what looked like some pretty like consistent common characteristics. The problem was <laughs> for biologists that were studying these was that when their genes were sequenced, it was found that they actually did not have a common ancestor, that they didn't have the shared genes and the shared gene sequences necessary to um, support the fact that they had any common ancestry. So if they didn't share a common ancestor, they all had to be reclassified. So these were either moved into different families of plants, 
okay, based on genomic similarities, or they had to create whole new taxonomic groups for some of them that didn't belong anywhere, and all of them were reclassified. So it's a great reminder that we need to be open-minded about what to do when we get new information. Classification is a great example of something being falsifiable. Like I can say what isn't correct, but I can't prove anything. All I can do is take the um, information that I have at the time and put together the best hypothesis and then be open-minded um, towards changing that when new information becomes available. When I first learned biology, we learned it this way, that there was a common ancestor and that ancestor diverged into prokaryotes, you know, things like bacteria that lacked a nucleus, and eukaryotes. And those were the two major classifications. We would then look at things like, you know, animals and plants and fungus and things like that. There's a new system for classifying all organisms, however, and they are now classified not as prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but into three domains. And what makes this new classification system so interesting is that eubacteria and archaebacteria are both prokaryotes. They both lack a nucleus, they both have a cell cell wall, all of that kind of stuff. But we're actually finding that there are more differences between eubacteria and archaebacteria than there are between archaebacteria and eukaryotes. So one of the things that evolutionary biologists did is they based sequences on ribosomal RNA. So that's the type of RNA that makes up the ribosomes. And the most likely evolutionary pathway for these organisms was that from a common ancestor, it diverged into eubacteria and then some kind of common ancestor that was shared by archaebacteria and eukaryotes. So again, what's really interesting to me is that some of these archaebacteria have more in common with you than they do with other prokaryotes. So it's no longer good enough just to say, oh, well, prokaryotes and eukaryotes are the big domains. Those are the big differences. Not so much, okay? It's um, all, again, based on these evolutionary origins. And so, again, a great example of needing to be open-minded, right? Getting rid of old ways of thinking and reimagining how things might have evolved from common ancestors based on genetic information.